found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 to 18. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of our darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in clay pots to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to the death of For Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore, I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed every day. For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Brian. Thank you, Nancy. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we love the blessing of being here, gathered together in your name, for a chance to be with you, a chance to open ourselves up to your spirit. Uh, in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that you'll do that now, that you'll open us up uh, to your word and to your spirit and to your truth in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It is the, um, it's the first Sunday in May, and that means that it's Star Wars Day. And therefore, I offer you the traditional Star Wars greeting, which is, May the 4th be with you. This is an actual thing. The, um, how many of you have seen one of the Star Wars movies? Show of hands. Uh, a lot of you. How many of you have ever seen any movie? <laughs> so, I, pretty much. Pretty much most of you. Therefore, I think uh, it'll be fair um, for me to proceed with what I have planned. We're going to do a little movie quiz this morning. And this is how it's going to work. I'm going to describe a generic movie plot structure uh, briefly. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about that. So the plot structure, the the sort of generic plot structure that I'm thinking about, that I have in mind, looks like this. You have a couple of characters. They come together. Um, When the one, uh, when the the sort of the lead figure, the the male lead of the the movie, shows up on the scene, um, the other character is really challenged by him, but attracted to him at the same time. So it's kind of a a mixed thing. He's very attractive, but they also um, find that the things he says and does are very challenging. Um, Nonetheless, the more time they spend together, the more sort of you can see the relationship deepening. There's still problems, but you can kind of see it deepening. But at the same time in this type of movie, uh, that these 
uh, two people are meeting, there's this big crisis going on, this thriller sub, you know, plot. There's uh, some big geopolitical crisis going on, and things get more and more complicated, and more, there's more and more danger and difficulty. And it culminates with a situation where uh, both uh, the, the lead character, his life is in jeopardy, and the life uh, of all the characters is in jeopardy, and just when we think that all is lost, the hero saves the day. And afterwards, the two characters are joyfully reunited, and uh, in many cases, you know, everything's been solved, um, the bad guys have been defeated. They make a decision to, um, to ultimately get married, and after that, they live... Right, very good. That's the first question on the quiz. They live happily ever after. Now, show of hands, how many have seen or heard of a movie which more or less follows this plot line? <laughs> ah, yes, we all have, of course. Second question, how many of you are married? Okay, uh, how many of you have parents who are married? <laughs> and how many of you know somebody who's married? Okay, so, so I think that we can probably come to a fairly broad consensus that lovely as this idea of happily ever after is, it's not as simple as it's made to sound at the end uh, of many movies and many fairy stories. Um, happiness comes in, in many cases, and ever after comes in many cases, but it's not easy, and it's not simple. Third question. How many of you have figured out that this basic generic movie plot that I've described is the basic plot of Jesus' life as it's described to us in the four Gospels in the Bible? Now, Jesus' relationship with his followers isn't a romance, but it's a love story. And indeed, the scriptures themselves describe the relationship between uh, Christ, between Jesus and his followers, between Christ and the church as the relationship between a bridegroom and a bride. And all of the other elements are there. When Jesus shows up on the scene, people who meet him are attracted to him but challenged by him. There's this difficult, ambiguous, powerful relationship that develops. But the more time they spend with him, the deeper that gets. And you have this geopolitical thing going on with the scribes and the Pharisees and the authorities in Jerusalem who are challenged by him, and we all know how that culminates, and it does come to a crisis where his life is in jeopardy and the life of his followers is in jeopardy, and indeed, he dies. And we think, and certainly his followers, were tempted to think that all was lost. But he does save the day. He saves himself for it. He and the Father together save him, and he saves us. And some of the most tender scenes in the scriptures are those joyful reunions afterward, at the end of the, the gospel movie, where Jesus and his followers are, re, are reunited um, uh, on the way to the tomb or in the upper room or by the Sea of Galilee. And what happens is, is that those followers say, we love you, and we'll go with you anywhere, and we won't doubt you. And what Jesus says is, I love you, and I will never leave you. They even, in fact, there even, in fact, is a marriage, um, because we know that a few weeks after Christ's ascension came the day of Pentecost, when Christ's Holy Spirit came and inhabited the lives of uh, Jesus' followers of his church. And they became, in a very real sense, one flesh um, together. So the Gospels end in that kind of happily ever after mode. If you take a look at, um, at them closely, all four of the Gospel accounts that we have end on this kind of very positive note. At the end of Matthew, uh, the last verse or so of Matthew says, has Jesus saying to his disciples, Go and make disciples, and lo, I am with you till the end of time. At the end of Mark, it says that the disciples then went out and preached 
and the Lord worked with them. The end of Luke recounts that the disciples went back to Jerusalem full of joy, and they worshipped in the temple, and they waited with excited anticipation for that day of Pentecost that uh, Jesus had told them to wait for. And John's gospel ends with this, this gorgeously sweet scene of reconciliation between Peter who felt so crushed because he betrayed his Lord. There's this lovely scene where he professes his love. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on you because that's what I need from people. It's it's lovely. So if you just read those Gospels, you do get that kind of, okay, it's done, the work is done. We're set now. It's happily ever after. And it is. But it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the movie. Because for the apostles, for those followers of Jesus, this was just the beginning. Because now Jesus has ascended. Now Jesus is gone. The physical Jesus is gone from among them. And they um, now have this work to do. They now are going, okay, so now it's us. And I have a question for you. And it's a question that plagues me. I've often wondered how they felt at that point. My question is, did they feel strong or did they feel weak? Were they feeling strong at that point or were they feeling weak? It was a time of new beginning for them and it's a time of new beginning um, for us here. I mean, to begin with, we're all from Toronto. So uh, we've just been through Uh, a miserable winter. But May's here, and May for a lot of people means spring, right? A couple of weeks from now, it's going to be the long weekend, the time when we're officially allowed to go out in our gardens without, you know, compacting the lawn too badly. Um, But it's spring. There's green stuff out there around us, and after such a long winter, you can't help but have a sense of anticipation and hope, and and there's new stuff going to happen at this point. And, And for Kingsway Baptist Church, In the first week of May in 2014, it's a time of new beginning as well. And the same question applies. How are we feeling, Kingsway? Are we feeling strong or are we feeling weak? Are we feeling tired? Well, that story of the apostles, uh, the early church, doesn't have to be a mystery to us because Although the Gospels end on this kind of happily ever after note, um, the New Testament also contains uh, this wonderful account that Luke gives us of what the Apostles did, called the Acts of the Apostles. And we have these letters written by Paul and by Peter and by other Apostles that um, give us information about what was going on for the next 40 or 50 or 60 years in terms of the early church and how it was proceeding forward from that point. And here's the thing. Although the Gospels end with this kind of, it's done, it's finished, I've done the work, it's happily ever after, it would be a mistake to think that the suffering and the hardship and the danger and the peril stopped. Because they didn't. What happened was that the apostles then experienced all of the same suffering and hardship and peril and danger that Christ did during his ministry. They were maligned, they were um, attacked, they were persecuted, they were arrested, they were tried, they were beaten, they were tortured. Many of them died, some of them were executed. Peter, tradition tells us, was executed upside down. They followed their Lord uh, into a very hard place. Now, another a misconception that you might have, kind of a general conclusion that you might arrive at or comfort yourself with, you say, yeah, but you know, it was the early church, they were all there, you know, they, these were people who had met Jesus. They probably, at least if they had all this external hardship and persecution, they probably were, had this wonderful joy of being all together. You know, they were there together, they, they knew what they knew and they believed what they believed and they had unity and they had harmony, they were, they were together in community. And that would be fantastic. But that's not what happened. You read the Acts of the Apostles and you read the letters um, uh, 
that make up the rest of the New Testament, and you find that the early church, even even led by people who had walked with Christ, was plagued by all kinds of problems. They had disagreements, they had discord, they had power struggles, they had leadership struggles, they had factions that were formed, they had character assassination, they had people who left the church over all of this stuff. All of that happened to the early church, to the church in Acts, to the church in the New Testament. And one of the best places to see that going on uh, was in the church in Corinth. We know a lot about what was going on in the church in Corinth because we have these two fairly long letters written by Paul to the church at Corinth addressing all of these kinds of things going on. Um, After the uh, letter to the church in Rome, um, the book of Romans, the two letters to the Corinthians are the two longest letters of Paul's that we have in the New Testament. Now these two books, First and Second Corinthians, are, are cherished scriptures. They're full of some of the sweetest, most beautiful, most moving, most powerful passages that we know in scripture. It's in uh, the letters to the Corinthians that we have Paul's wonderful description of what's going on during the Lord's Supper. Um, It's very likely that in a few minutes when Nancy leads us in communion, she will borrow Paul's words um, from Corinthians uh, in uh, administering uh, communion. It's in Corinthians that we get Paul's fullest um, and most detailed description of spiritual gifts where he talks about all the different spiritual gifts, and he talks about how in the church different people with different gifts um, act together as different parts of the same body, the body of Christ. That's all in Corinthians. It's in Corinthians that we find that famous descriptive passage which tells us about God's love. You know, the famous one that, that even people who never go to church have heard because they've gone to a wedding where... Um, That passage is read out. Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. Two weeks ago at at Easter, um, Bruce Neal was up here preaching, and he chose as his central passage this wonderful passage from Corinthians where, where, where Paul summarizes the gospel, and it's the most wonderfully jam packed, succinct, perfect description of the hope that we have, of who Christ is and why we believe in him and what he means to us. Uh, All of these wonderful treasures are in Corinthians, but if you sit down, if you go home this afternoon and you pick up your Bible and you open up one of these letters, 1st or 2nd Corinthians, and you just read it through from start to finish, it is a tough, tough read. It is a difficult read. Because it's full of discussions of leadership struggles and factions in the church and disputes over money. And it's full of questions about truth and authority and who can do what and how is this supposed to work. It's a tough tough book for any Christian to read, but I found it very tough uh, to read at this time in my walk. And I think... If we could have the Apostle Paul here, um, Nancy could come up and interview him here at the front, ask him two or three key questions. Um, and And she said to him, Paul, when you wrote those letters to the church in Corinth, what's your feeling? At that time, was the church, was Christ's church, was it strong or was it weak? And the Scripture's been very clear that Paul would say, oh, it was weak. No question. I don't have to hesitate, Nancy. We can go on to the next question. It was weak. And Nancy, who, you know, has this gift of compassion in, in abundance, would be genuinely struck by this, I think, if I know Nancy, and say, that, like, aren't you concerned about that, Paul? And Paul would say, no, I'm not concerned. And Nancy would say, and why aren't you concerned? How can it be that, that you, a leader in the church, feel that the church is so weak and yet it's not a point of concern to you? And I think that when Paul answered, he would probably come pretty close to quoting 
the beginning of the passage that Nancy read a little bit earlier. I think his answer would come from today's passage, and I think that what he would say is this. I'm not concerned about the weakness of the church or the people in it or the leaders because what we preach is not ourselves. What we preach is Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the faith of face of Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, in weak vessels, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now this, this is an appropriate posture for all church leaders to take, whether professional ministry or lay leaders. This is the correct posture for, uh, for a church leader to take when speaking to a congregation, and that is, my standing up here behind this pulpit or at the front of this meeting or in this context, my standing up here isn't about me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. I preach the Lord Jesus Christ. The gift that I've been given is knowledge of who Christ is. And the treasure that I share with you, the treasure that any leader shares with you, is knowledge of who Christ is. And I think most leaders will say, I'm not a fit vessel for such a message. But it's in a way right that I'm not such a fit vessel because the focus shouldn't be on the messenger, it should be on the message. Now, if you think about it, this was a a really important point then at the time Paul was writing this. Because if in those 30 or 40 or 50 years after Christ ascended, if during that time what made the church work, what gave it strength, what accounted for all of that spectacular growth that they have, what allowed them to persevere through all of those persecutions and troubles and divisions, if, if what allowed that to happen was Paul, his strength, his wisdom, his humility, his, his conviction, his power, well, there's a problem, and that is that Paul died. And when Paul died, the church would have died. Or if it had been Peter, Christ said to Peter, you're the rock that I'm going to build my church on. And he was. But if the church's success, if the church's power had come from Peter, the rock, that rock was pulverized to dust. Eventually. Eventually he died. And if the power had been with him or with the other apostles, the church would have died. But we know that the church didn't die. I mean, around the time that Paul was writing these letters, right, around the time that the apostles were starting to die off, we're talking about a few thousand Christians in a few dozen churches spread around the eastern end of the Mediterranean inside of an empire that had just gotten a new emperor who had made it his personal project to eradicate Christianity. And 2,000 years ago, depending on whose numbers you work with, there's something over 2 billion Christians in the world. There are 2 billion followers of Jesus Christ in the world today. And that's now. I mean, we, um, we I think, uh, need to hear this lesson now. It's an important lesson for the church now uh, in our time in the last 50 years because it's very popular Uh, among us, and particularly among those of us who are a bit older, to kind of think, and and indeed the scholars that I I study with, the teachers, the professors that teach my courses at Wycliffe, to talk about how we're in a post-Christendom world, that, you know, in the 50s, you know, there were all these churches and they were vibrant because the understanding was that in Canadian society we were Christians, everybody went, but now we're in a post-Christendom world and not not a month of our lives goes by that you don't see some article or hear some story on the radio or the TV that talks about how, well, you know, Christianity is dying off, religion is dead, God's dead, people don't believe in any of this stuff anymore. And sometimes we think, wow, is Christianity in trouble? And, the, and my reply to that is, really? Really? You think Christianity is in trouble? What, are we going to drop down to only one billion of us? But the reason 
The reason that the church isn't in trouble is because it's about Christ. There may be in the church now, there was in Paul's time, there was through the Middle Ages, and there has been in the last 300 years, and there has been in the last 50 years, and there has been in our church for the last 10 years, and there has been in our church for the last year, struggles, difficulties, challenges with leadership and, and, and all of these things. And does that mean that God's plan isn't working out, that things aren't going the way they were supposed to? And the answer is no. No. The church is continuing to do what it's always done, and that is be governed by a sovereign and powerful God. And the reason why it never has been and never will be built on the strength and competence and consistency of the people who are in it or their leaders is because it's about Jesus Christ. Jesus is what you get when you become a Christian, when you come to believe, when you um, hear the good news of the gospel. Now, we've got all kinds of false understandings about what that good news is, what it is you get when you become a Christian, right? There are, sadly in our society, many people who are Christians who think that what you get is that when you become a Christian, then you get financial prosperity. You get wealth. You get material blessing. You get success in your career. It's called the prosperity gospel. Well, the prosperity gospel isn't the good news. There is a a kind of a health gospel, right? There are people who think, if I could just get right with God, if I could just get right with Jesus, then I'll have health, and right? I won't get sick, or all of my illnesses will be healed. I'll, I'll, I'll be made whole and right completely. And they have this, this health gospel. But the good news of Jesus isn't primarily that he's going to make you healthy. There's a kind of a help gospel, You never hear anybody talk about this very much, but there's this kind of sense of, now that I'm a Christian, I've got the Christian life, I belong to a church, it's fantastic, because what happens is I just go along and lead my life, but every now and then, if something goes wrong, if I have a problem, if I have a difficulty, if I have a challenge, I can call the help desk. And I can get help with that challenge in life. And there's some truth in that, but that's not... The good news of the gospel isn't that you get help with your problems in your life. There's a happiness gospel. There are people who think, wow, you know, you're going along, you're miserable in your life, and you get to know Jesus, you get to know Christ, and you become happy. Like, you're just happy all the time. It's just happy, happy, happy. And it's not true. That's not the good news. The good news isn't get born again, you'll be happy every minute for the rest of your lives. There are people who think, essentially, it's this kind of religious view, that what you get when you become a Christian and you read the Bible and you, and you uh, sort of become involved in organized religion is you get a manual for how to live your life. You get guidelines, rules, structures, Things. So, if there's anything that comes up, you're not sure what to do, you crack open your Bible, you go, oh, operator's manual says here that what I should do is this, or what I hear should do is that. And there's some truth in that, but that's not the good news. The good news of the gospel, the thing that you get when you get with Christ, is you get Christ. You get Jesus himself. You get the living Lord of all creation in you, in your life, in relationship with you. You get Jesus, who was with God in the beginning, but but was willing to come down and take on human flesh to be with us. You get uh, someone who came and was willing to suffer and to die for you. What you get is this Son of God who was with God at the beginning of creation. He was there taking part when you were created in the womb. He's there walking with you through your whole life. He's there waiting to welcome you when your life is done and you go home. This This is what you get. You get Christ. You get Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. But when you get Christ, you get all of him.
And because you get to share in his life and his resurrection, you share in his pain and in his suffering. That comes with the package. It's part of what happens. In the rest of this passage, Paul speaks to the Corinthians and he describes his own experience. But he describes it in terms in which he says, these things that are happening to me, these things I'm experiencing are a blessing to you, the church that I serve. But you can read these passages and understand them as applying to all of us. And after he makes that uh, reference to uh, jars of clay, Paul goes on to say this, to describe how things are going for him, how things are going for the church. And he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, we're confused, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we don't feel abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. I think there are many who will find that that description of life sometimes applies to us. We share in Christ's suffering and death so that we can share in his life and in his resurrection. And in that, our role, our task, the thing that we've been set to do, the reason, the, the place we have in God's economy, if you will, is that we bear witness to who Christ is. Take a look what Paul says, what he goes on to say. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Look at the sequence that Paul lays out. It goes like this. Life happens. You have trouble. You have difficulty. You have suffering. You have pain. These things happen. But because of what we know, because of this treasure that we carry about who Christ is and who God is and how they love us, because of that, we continue to believe, even in the hardship. And because we believe, we speak of our belief. We speak of it with our words. We speak of it with who we are. We speak of it with our actions. And because we speak of it in that way, because we bear witness to Christ in our lives, people see that and they hear that. It is for the benefit of those around us so that they can get some of this grace. They can come into this place of relationship with Christ. So, the question remains for us, for King's Way on the morning of May the 4th, 2014. Do you feel strong or do you feel weak? Each of us, I think, would have to answer that on our own, but I know what my answer is. And frankly, I feel weak and I thank God for it. Paul concludes this passage, and I'll conclude uh, my comments today with um, a passage which reads like a benediction. It's a lovely, lovely passage. Nancy read it for us beautifully, and I'll read it again now. Therefore, Paul concludes in his remarks to the Corinthians, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day by that spirit that came into us. For our light and momentary troubles, I love that phrase. This is the Apostle Paul, for heaven's sakes. Elsewhere in Corinthians, he makes a list of the stuff that's happened to him. You know, I was tortured this many times. I was, you know, nearly executed this many times. I've been in two shipwrecks. You know, I've been homeless for this many months. He goes through this whole list of stuff. The guy, you know, the guy spent most of his career in prison under a death sentence. And what he says is, (laughs) these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. If you as an individual, if we as a church are feeling weak, if 
we're facing hardship, if we're experiencing suffering, if we're tired. Paul says to us, Christ says to us, God says to us, look, in the big picture of your life and in the big picture of the meaning of your life, these things are temporary. Don't focus all of your attention on the circumstances that you're in. Jesus says, focus your attention on me. Amen.